Hello again, students. In this Chem 1A lesson, we're going to learn about para and diamagnetism. So it makes sense that our learning objective is to distinguish between diamagnetic and paramagnetic ions and atoms. So we'll learn what the definition of these terms are and learn about what the property is of paramagnetism. This property relates to the fourth quantum number, which you'll recall is called the spin quantum number. This quantum number deals not with the orientation or the location of an electron around an atom, but it actually has a property of the electron unto itself. It refers to the idea that electrons actually spin on their axes, just like the Earth spins on its axis as it circles around the Sun. And when a charged particle spins, like an electron, which has a negative charge, it creates a magnetic field. So now there's two possible ways in which an electron can spin. It can spin to the right or it can spin to the left. And depending on the direction that it spins, it will create either a positive magnetic field or a negative magnetic field. So that's where we get our plus one half and negative one half quantum numbers from. We know that according to Hund's rule, when there are degenerate orbitals, we will place one electron in each of the um, each of those equivalent orbitals before we start partnering them up. And we also know that when we do uh, partner up electrons within the same orbital, that they must have the opposite spin. When we have two electrons in an orbital and they have the opposite spin, their two magnetic fields cancel out. However, when we have an atom or an ion that has unpaired electrons, there will be a net magnetic field created by that material. So in an atom or ion with, containing unpaired electrons, we have the property of paramagnetism, meaning there exerts a magnetic field. When an atom or ion consists of its orbitals having paired electrons only, then no magnetic field will be generated, and this is called diamagnetism. So in a minute, we're going to look at what happens given a paramagnetic and a diamagnetic substance. So to prepare you for that, we're going to look at some orbital diagrams. The two materials that we'll be studying in this video coming up are zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate. So in both cases, we're dealing with divalent cations from the fourth period of the periodic table. Then they sit in the transition metal area or the D block elements. So we'll start out with the elemental orbital diagrams. And so starting with lowest energy, we're going to fill in our electrons first into the 4s orbital and then add one to each of the 3d orbitals and then pair them up with the opposite spin. So elemental zinc has the electron configuration of two electrons in the 4s orbital and 10 electrons in the 3d orbital. Remember that the elect when a metal loses electrons, it's going to lose the electrons that have the lowest effective nuclear charge, which usually is the electrons within the s and p orbitals. d orbitals are held more tightly to the nucleus and are so are not lost when ions are formed, or typically not lost when ions are formed. So when zinc loses two electrons to form zinc 2, those, bo both of those electrons will be lost from the 4s orbital. So zinc 2 plus has the electron configuration of all of the core electrons from argon and then all of the 3d electrons present with the 4s orbital being empty. 
Now let's look at manganese. Manganese has a has um, <clears throat> seven electrons added on after argon. So the first two will go into that 4s orbital. Then we'll add one electron at a time to each of our 3d orbitals. And you'll see that we only had five electrons left. So we have a perfect half filled shell in our 3d orbital. There we go. <laughs> so with manganese two, the same uh, idea applies in terms of the valence electrons. The 4s electrons are held less tightly than the 3d electrons, and so those are the ones that are going to be shed. So when we form a cation of manganese, we have a, an atom with a half-filled 3d shell. So looking at the orbital diagrams for zinc-2 and manganese-2, which of these materials would you predict is paramagnetic? And how could we test that? So here we have a couple of small vials filled with zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate. And these small vials are connected to a ring stand using a string. And what I'm holding in my hand here is a strong rare earth magnet called a neodymium magnet. First I'll approach the manganese sample. Observe that the vial was attracted to the magnet and pulled up with it. I'm now studying the strings of both samples. I'm going to pause for a minute and really let that zinc sample start, stop swinging. Now that it's a little bit more steady, I'll bring my magnet next to the zinc sample. And you notice I'm getting very, very close to the sample, but the vial is not coming up to the magnet. Again with manganese, you can see that the vial was pulled towards my magnet. Again with the zinc sample no real response. So the unpaired electrons in manganese sample were attracted to a magnet, and that's how we test for paramagnetism. The fully paired electrons of the 3d orbitals on the zinc sample did not behave in that manner. In fact, diamagnetic materials will sometimes display a slight aversion to a magnet, so they'll be repelled by a magnet. So here we can see how we can quickly test whether a material is paramagnetic or diamagnetic using a strong magnet. To sum up this unit, we can take together how what we've learned about electron configurations and orbital diagrams and link them to this concept of paramagnetism. So here are three ions to that you can use as examples. So figure out what their electron configurations would be and sketch out their orbital diagrams. And then ask the question, are any of these ions likely to be paramagnetic? All right, have fun with it. I'll see you next time.